I really fell in love with Prince Rupert because it is rich in history, it's an absolute hub for adventure, and all of it is really just a short trip from downtown. Today we're loading up the motorhome and we're heading out to a brand new... Oh yeah, Mick is here, got that beer, party time. Mick, I'm in the, I'm in the middle. And where is all of the groceries? I got it. I got a box of fermented water, one large coffee, and road pop. Okay, well first, you can't say road pop on camera. And second, what about literally everything from the list? Well, I don't know what you're so mad about. There's nothing on this list, so I just got the essentials. Hey, Mick. Would you flip over that piece of paper, bud? Oh, uh, it's like a trick list. No, it's not a trick. Like a magic trick. <laughs> what? Well, you know what happens now? This week, you're eating canned food. Well, if you're going to be rude about it, I'm not sharing my water with you. This road is not what I would really consider motorhome friendly, but at least we're not open ocean boating in a storm this week, so I'm not complaining. get bad after our turn off here because that was really easy that was no problem at all North Pacific cannery is the last remaining intact cannery on the coast and actually North America these were canneries that were all over the coast there was about 30 just in the Skeena River area at one time. Five just in the Inverness Passage here where we sit. So it's kind of taking a way of life that is now gone. And people can come back and reminisce or learn about how the salmon industry was back 100 years ago, more. We're very lucky to have people come back on site that have can remember it the way it was because we can only imagine it but to actually live here and experience a fishing season and as soon as somebody comes on site that lived and worked here I could run to kind of get that story and just listen because it's they're they're fading the cannery opened in 1889 by John Carthew 12 men came up from Vancouver, um, and which is kind of neat. I was reading that a lot of the lumber for the cannery, once they had gotten the main structure up, was milled at Georgetown Mills in Lac de Lambs. It ran from 1889 right up until 1971, and then it closed, but then it reopened in 72. So it was over 90 years of operation. And then the reduction plant, it did stay open until 81 and the net loft um, and machine shop. And it ran under Anglo-British Columbia Packers for its whole life, so that's pretty amazing. A lot of canneries switched names and owners. North Pacific Cannery did um, have a couple owners, obviously, over 90 years, but it always stayed under that packing company. I think life working at the cannery here at North Pacific was definitely a, a hard life. Like they had long shifts and depending, because when you go through North Pacific cannery, you go through different eras. Like we have the manual canning line where we, we have the one thing called the sliming tanks and those women would stand there cleaning um, salmon. And it got the name the sliming tanks because the water was fresh at the beginning of the shift. And then you gotta imagine all that fish that was getting in there cleaning. And they didn't change that water till the end. So it got the name the Sliming Tanks. And uh, 
you know, that water was cold. And there's some stories of women standing in hot water just to keep their body temperature warm. Because even in the summertime, even for us working as tour guides and whatnot, it's cold here. The wind coming through the floorboards and then the doors being open. And you can imagine having your hands in that cold water. But then the men on the fishing boats, they all they had was like a pop tent or a sail to keep them dry and warm when they were out on the fishing grounds. And they would be out there for days. You can tell that these buildings are not insulated. So it's pretty cold because you're sitting right on the, you know, our house was on stilts above the water. I grew up in the cannery down the road. Just around the point there, there was a cannery called Sunnyside, and that's where I spent the early years of my life. My dad was a fisherman. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. My grandmother worked in the cannery, but my mother always stayed home because I was young. Running water, I remember going to the mountain across the tracks to have the water run down, and we would gather, you know, get pails of water that way. Uh, it was pretty, I guess, rustic life, but as a young child, you don't really question anything. That's what it is, that's life. We do have some pictures in the main cannery of children of the canneries, and it was basically uh, kind of like an ode to the children that lived here because so many kids lived here and the pictures are quite neat they've got kids with like, ice cream all over their faces and then you look at the boardwalks and there's no railings they're like oh wow yeah it, this place really left their mark on people's lives as a young child my parents always said you're never to go down to the floats or on the tracks without an adult sure so I'm down at the water and I'm walking around the pilings and it was had a frame around the piling which was of course wet and slippery and I'm walking around and in I go. <laughs> I was fortunate enough that I think the kid there was about 13 and he pulled me out and took me home. But I, I remember thinking, oh God, should have drowned, I'm just dead. <laughs> My grandparents lived right next door, so that was always a very uh, strong memory. Fortunate enough to have grandparents in my life. Um, I remember the fishing and, and the fact that, uh, you know, my dad used to sometimes bring the boat right up to the front of the house if the tide was, was high enough, so that was fun. We had generators out there for power, because there were obviously no hydro lines back then but the generators were usually shut off at seven o'clock, so you said, there's not much to do in the winter time. <laughs> and when I was six and I started school, because the road ended at Port Edward and we had no school, I went and stayed with my aunt who lived in Port Edward. And so on Friday night, she would take me and put me on the train and I'd take the train home because the train ran. And so Friday night I'd go home on the train and then Sunday afternoon my dad would take me back on the boat. So really that was our, that was our transportation. So to get into town you would have to take the boat to poor dad and usually call the cab from there. You know history is not always kind and North Pacific was very segregated but uh, people did come together for a common goal so we have a lot of uh, good memories from here, not so many sad ones. The, the villages were all completely segregated, so each cannery had the Japanese section, and in North Pacific it's, it's down that way. Um, in Sunnyside, it's actually the closest to North Pacific was the Japanese section. And then we were separated by a bit of a boardwalk, and the, our closest neighbors to us were the Simpson. I know quite a few of them very well. We grew up together, and I still see them around town. And then further down the boardwalk were the 
the Nishka, but as a young child I wasn't allowed to wander that far by myself, so I didn't really know them. And then here you have the, the European manager's houses, as you can see from here. In Sunnyside, they were actually uh, literally on the other side of the tracks. So up on the hill were all the sort of the big manager's houses. So it was very different. But, you know, the, the people, all the cultures coexisted and they worked together. In, but even in their working situations, I thought they were segregated. So you'd have the Japanese working in one line and the First Nations in another. And of course, the Chinese were only men because they usually left their families over in China and they came over to work and they were just males that came to the county to work. So I, I grew up, I never ever saw a Chinese woman or child, ever. I always kind of get a kick out of how close the First Nations area was the Chinese and you can see that influence in Rupert's culture like fish and rice and soy sauce on lots of things and chow mein buns in Prince Rupert are huge so I, I kind of think well was that because of the canneries and them living so close together was all the canneries segregated the same way and that's why the influence uh, into the cuisine was so strong I'm not sure I'm not sure how they sort of decided on who would do the work. The Chinese men were always the butchers just because it sounded like they were very adept at it and they could chop off heads and tails with lightning speed. <laughs> My grandparents were the ones who immigrated from Japan. They came with their own culture. Our traditions are ones that came with our grandparents at the turn of the century. And every country evolves, but I've noticed that because we're over here, that change hasn't been as, as pronounced as it is back in Japan. Things have changed over there because everything evolves. But I think we evolve slowly because we don't have the influences around us, right? So, um, for instance, the Japanese, it's always been traditional. New Year's Day is a big, big day. And I still maintain New Year's Day. I still do an open house. I have 40 to 60 people through my house. And the people in Japan go, well, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> so, you know, because it's just evolution, right? There was a large Japanese population in the canneries before World War II. And then, of course, with the war, the boats were confiscated. The Japanese were all rounded up and interned. And at the end of the war, they were not allowed to return to the coast. The war ended in 1945, and they weren't allowed to return to the coast until April 1st, 1949. So towards the end of World War II, the Japanese were given an option. They were told you could either go east or repatriate to Japan. Well, if you're born in Canada, <laughs> repatriation is not an option. So my family, my parents, my grandparents, they all moved to Montreal. very small percentage of the Japanese actually did come back. Many of them had made their homes back east. And my dad, I guess it was the call of the sea. You know, he was a fisherman before the war and that's a lifestyle that's hard to, to give up, I think. And that, that's probably why he came back. The thing that I admire most about the Japanese is we're pretty resilient. <laughs> When you think about the fact that everything was taken from them and they were able to come back after the war and, and basically rebuild. I actually have a cousin who grew up in Montreal and he start, his grandfather fished for North Pacific. So when he was 11 years old, he started coming out to deckhand for his grandfather. He used to take the train from Montreal <laughs> 
out here, what, four days? And he would take the train and then he would get off here at the cannery and he would spend the, the summer with his grandparents and he'd fish with his grandfather and then at the end of the season hop back on the train to go back home. And he did that for years and then he got a degree from McGill. But he said to me once, when I think of home, it's North Pacific. <laughs> There's names on the walls all over the cannery, and I think those are people that were leaving their mark and just showing that they were here. We'll be going up to fix like a leak in the roof, and you shine the flashlight down one way and there's all these names, and it's just so neat. It's like, man, I wonder who that person was that wrote that there. And it kind of puts a, like a bit of the uh, face to the cannery. You don't know who they are exactly, but you recognize those names. They're from this area. They're from Prince Rupert and Port Edward. I'm so glad like the people before me as manager left it, haven't cleaned it up. Like it makes it really more personal as a cannery and a home for the for everybody who worked here. Our job basically here at North Pacific is to kind of tell those stories, keep them alive, and keep these buildings alive too because they are once you know that's what makes North Pacific so unique it's our buildings because once these are gone then you know we don't have a story to tell really. When the cannery closed the First Nation homes were taken out into the Inverness and burnt those were over a hundred houses there and they were all gone. Inverness the next cannery up totally burnt to the ground. Of course, if anything starts burning, it'll go down. So when Sunnyside closed down, they were worried about vandals and, and squatters, so they actually consciously burnt the place down, which was sad. My husband actually worked in Port Edward at the time for BC Packers in the boat shop, and they actually went out and sat on the water to make sure that everything went. I said, you watch my family home burn. <laughs> and the, the sad part was they didn't really take anything out of the home. The last sort of tenants of were they took what they wanted, but other than that, they didn't bother. This part of the world is very harsh with the weather. Like we got 120 kilometer gale force winds here. Um, so a lot, if the buildings weren't taken care of, they got destroyed. We lost the Japanese net loft. A lot of the buildings around the Japanese section um, are, weren't able to be saved. And a lot of buildings, uh, I think when the cannery did close, unless they weren't inhabited, the elements just took them over. There are wooden buildings and they're old and we're worried about the pilings. And This is only a a portion of what was really here because a lot of buildings have been torn down or fallen down. Like we've had landslides on both sides of this cannery and I don't know there's like this vortex of specialness that's just keeping this cannery safe. There's three net lofts uh, at North Pacific Cannery. So you had the native net loft, the Japanese net loft, and then the European uh, net loft, which we, we have for storage. So the public's not really allowed up there, but it is a neat little spooky spot to go look around in. This net loft is actually one of my favorite buildings because it actually came from Port Essington, which is about 16 kilometers up the river. And when Port Essington was sort of becoming a ghost town, a lot of the buildings were sold off to different places, mostly canneries. And they floated it down in 1936 and put it on the pilings, all manpower. And here it's been sitting and it like creaks and groans. It seems like it has its own personality. It's quite neat. Um, but it was a very social place. This is where they stored all the nets for the winter. They would mend the nets up here. We've also been told basketball would be played up here, floor hockey. That's kind of neat to see that they would do that kind of stuff. And then seeing the First Nations homes were so small, this would be a huge place for people to gather. Under every net loft was a machine shop or a blacksmith shop back in the earlier days. And our machine shop was operational till 1981. 
and basically they just close the doors. Everything is just kind of there and it's kind of eerie, but you can turn it on. We have machines that all run and uh, that brings a lot of memories back to people because of that sound that the belts make. This down here is the machine shop uh, used by First Nations men here on site at the time. Uh, their work wasn't necessarily to do with the canning process itself, uh, more so with the fishermen out on the water. Uh, their jobs entirely were to uh, fix and repair all of the uh, marine engines that were located here on site. Of course, with this process, it did come a lot of trial and error, which did lead to a lot of injuries. But unfortunately, in the 1930s, labor laws just weren't so much a thing as they are now today. Now, as for the machines themselves, uh, they are all steam driven, just like all other machines here on site. Of course, nowadays we use electricity. Shoveling coal into those boilers is a lot of hard work. <laughs> and now when all of the machines turn on, uh, they're typically running at about 15 to 25% speed, like we keep all of the other machines here on site at. Half and half today. Not too bad. Just like the automated canning line, all of the belts and wheels are used to activate all of the other machines here on site, uh, such as the saws, the sanders, uh, the hydraulic presses that used to be hooked up, and even the metal lathe back over there. Yeah, you have to slam it. And then it works great. This one as well is a little bit more dangerous compared to some of the other machines here on site, mainly because of how exposed and low all of the uh, belts get down. However, this one, just like the other ones, you're also able to turn on and off. Pretty incredible. That's amazing. So this first machine right over here is what we call the Iron Butcher. This was entirely operated by Chinese men here starting roughly in the 1930s. What they would do here is load all of the salmon into the very backs of the machine where two large blades were able to cut off the heads and the tails of all of the salmon. Afterwards, the body of the salmon would have to fall tail first down this little chute over here to then be loaded onto the main arm of the machine. Now, when the machine was activated at the time, the arm could come down and grab onto the tail of that salmon, allowing for the fins and even some of the scales to be removed in that process. Now, the main part of the iron butcher here was the cylinder in the middle there. This was to allow the brushes on the very ends of the machine to brush the guts out. Afterwards, they were all swept out into the water. After the fish gets butchered, it gets brought up the line over here into what we call the cleaning station. Now, the cleaning station here would have been entirely operated by First Nations women, as they were considered the most delicate to work with all of the fish. All of the cans on site were made and fabricated upstairs in our canning loft. They would all be shipped to us from China using these flat cans like this right over here, to be then fed into machines upstairs, forming them into perfect cylinders. Now these cans being fed down the machine would get loaded into the automatic packing machine. Now when this machine was installed in the 1930s, it added salt to the lines with these cans of salmon, something that was never added beforehand. Now of course this was a machine from the 1930s, so it didn't necessarily always do the greatest of jobs and sometimes underfilled all of these cans of salmon. It was a bit of an issue, so they had to add the next machine right over here, the weighing machine. Now, it was very, very simple. Uh, every single day, whatever sized and weight can would go through these lines, they would essentially calibrate each of the arms to match that specific weight. All of the correct cans went down the first line over here, and all of the incorrect cans would go down the second one. Uh, you would have found two people standing over here, typically First Nations, uh, and they would have been in charge of adding salmon to these cans that are a little bit not, not uh, meeting the rest of the canned weights. The cans going through here ran at roughly 120 to 130 cans a minute, meaning there was never really any room for these ladies to put those cans back onto their original track. Oftentimes they had to pinch or smush their fingers just to get the cans back onto the correct part of the line. So this right over here is the uh, clinching machine, the automated clincher, and it essentially would take can uh, lids like this one right over here with a rubber seal and essentially stamp it onto the tops of these cans. 
Now, of course, this was not creating a complete seal on all of these products. However, it was ensuring that nothing could get inside of these cans once the lid was pressed on tight. The vacuum sealer right over here was the final part before cooking, and it would allow all of the air inside of these cans to be sucked out and for that rubber seal to melt on each one of those lids to completely secure the can, sealing it tight for cooking. These two uh, machines right over here are our automatic retorts. These were steam driven, just like everything else in the line here, uh, and would fit three to four of these uh, metal bins inside of each of them. You would wheel them inside and then close the metal door in the middle there, allowing everything to be sealed shut. And it would cook for roughly 65 minutes at 240 degrees Fahrenheit or 115 degrees Celsius, allowing all of the salmon to be cooked into the cans themselves. Afterwards, they would have to place up all of these cans off to the side in a separate room for roughly uh, 24 hours, allowing all of the tin to completely cool down before they can go through the labeling and then the packing process. When I was given the invitation to come out and produce this story, I had no idea how extensive this facility actually is. So I'm gonna upload a second video of just essentially a GoPro walk around. I wanna give a great big thank you to Heather, Mona and Corbin for taking the time out of their schedules to make this possible. And most of all, thanks for watching everybody. As always, take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints. I'll catch you on the next one.